One more outburst from you, Mr. Erickson, and I will hold you in contempt of court. The judge exclaimed, her face glowing red with anger. I couldn't help but suppress a laugh at her almost theatrical display of fury. Mr. Young, I strongly advise you to keep your client in check. I'd been on the receiving end of these warnings more than a few times, but let's be honest, keeping the word crap out of my vocabulary is easier said than done, especially when you're dealing with a judge like this. I recall someone once telling me they'd never known anyone to use that word more than I did. Maybe it's true, it just seems to flow out of me without any forethought. As I opened my mouth to respond, I noticed the judge tensing, bracing herself for what she probably expected to be a slew of expletives. My lawyer, Bert Young, quickly cautioned me, Watch your words, Jack, unless you fancy a night behind bars. Even the court recorder couldn't mask a giggle, likely anticipating the verbal storm that could ensue. Across the courtroom, familiar faces were a mix of emotions. My ex-best friend and his wife, alongside my soon-to-be ex-wife, all looked decidedly nervous. Robin, my estranged wife, appeared shamed and subdued. Bruce, the ex-buddy in question, sat defeated, while Cheryl, his wife, had a look of sheer annoyance. Clearly, having their personal disputes aired publicly wasn't to her liking. You might be wondering how I found myself at the mercy of this judge, whose competence I often questioned. Well, it all started on a rather ordinary Tuesday, because, well, it was a Tuesday. I'm Jack Erickson, a 32-year-old foreman for the City Maintenance Department in Stonemore, Colorado. My journey here began just two days post-high school graduation. In the winter months, you'll find me clearing snow from major roads, while summer sees me tackling a variety of maintenance tasks. In Stonemore, the maintenance department is divided into four sectors, each managed by a supervisor and a foreman. I handle one of these sectors. I never pursued college, relying instead on common sense and a knack for staying out of office politics. Generally, if a supervisor issues an order, the crew checks with someone like me before proceeding. We foremen have all risen through the ranks, unlike the supervisors, who are typically external hires. A severe thunderstorm hit on a Monday evening, bringing with it high winds and hail that littered my quadrant with debris. The next day was all about cleanup. I managed six crews, each with a dump truck, collecting the scattered debris. Driving around in a pickup, I attended to complaints about blocked storm drains, calling in vacuum trucks when needed. Our home life was simple yet comfortable. Robin and I lived in a quaint four-bedroom house in an established neighborhood, not quite affluent, but far from the rougher parts of town. We enjoyed good relations with our neighbors, Tom and Jerry McBain next door, Ron and Cindy behind us, and Bruce and Cheryl Harris just beyond the McBains. Bruce and I shared a history that dated back to middle school. I often led him into trouble, which was ironic given his parents' strict religious beliefs compared to my own family's LAX attitudes about religion. If Bruce was ever in hot water because of our antics, I'd take the fall. His parents might not have thought much of me, but Bruce grew up to mirror their devoutness, eventually becoming a preacher. I'm not much of a churchgoer, only making appearances on Easter and Christmas. But Robin, she's devoted attends every Sunday without fail. Bruce, during his days at Bible College, met Cheryl there. Picture this. Cheryl could have been right out of a magazine, standing fives, weighing 110 LBs, with blonde hair, blue eyes, and strikingly attractive. Yet beneath that glamorous exterior, she was a fervent prayer enthusiast. Bruce and I always contrasted sharply. He was the calm to my chaos. Yet there wasn't anything I wouldn't do for him, or at least that's what I believed. That particular Tuesday evening, I returned home to heat up some leftover meatloaf from Sunday. Cooking had become a rare event at home these days. I craved a beer, or twelve, but a glaring red mark on the calendar reminded me that I was on emergency standby, limiting me to just one. Dinner was a solitary affair, eaten while Robin disappeared into a lengthy shower. I found myself wishing she'd pay as much attention to me as she did to her lengthy bathing rituals. By 7 o'clock p.m., I doubted I'd see her again that night. Her customary greeting, how was your day, was delivered with minimal interest as she had done for months now, and I was growing weary of it. The excitement in our marriage had dwindled. Lovemaking had become a rare event, only twice in the last three months, and even those occasions felt obligatory. She seemed to barely notice me anymore. That night, as usual, I settled down to watch the Rockies take on the Padres, 
wishing for a shot of Jägermeister to spice up the evening. Just as I was about to call it a night around 10 o'clock, my phone rang. It was the city county dispatch. There was a water main break near Birchwood Mall. I quickly packed some snacks and headed out. At the city yard, I collected the keys, rounded up my crew, which included guys from every quadrant, a city water department supervisor, and four of their team members. We hooked up a trailer to the dump truck, loaded a backhoe, and set off for the break site. The street was flooded, a consequence of the storm sewers not being cleared by the Northwest crews, so I called in a vacuum truck. By 1 o'clock a.m., I was breaking pavement with the backhoe, hindered by the waterlogged conditions. By 3 o'clock, we had exposed the pipe and began hauling away the mud. By 8.45 a.m., the water team had reconnected the pipe and conducted tests, which the building inspector approved by around 9.30. By noon, we were prepped for repaving, which would be handled by a contractor. After returning the equipment to the yard by 1 o'clock, I pulled into my driveway around 1.45, off work until Friday. Inside, Robin was nowhere in sight, presumably out for the day which apparently didn't include any housework. I grabbed a beer and a sandwich. As I closed the fridge, the unmistakable sounds of love making echoed from upstairs. No wonder you don't screw me anymore, I muttered, grabbing my handgun from the coat closet. The noise intensified as I neared the master bedroom, but it was empty, as was the bathroom. Left with two options, I checked the guest bedroom, then kicked open the craft room door, gun in hand, but found it empty too. The sounds were loudest there, and noticing the open window overlooking the backyard, I peered out to see Tommy and Brenda McBain in their pool, caught in an intimate act, Tommy, a college junior, and Brenda about to start her freshman year. Stunned, I thought to myself. I thought this only happened in places like Mississippi, as I watched the unexpected scene unfold. I knew I shouldn't have been watching, yet it was like witnessing a car crash in slow motion. Did Tom or Jerry even know this was happening under their own roof? I highly doubted it. Even the most liberated folks I knew wouldn't stand for this. They're watching us. Look at them, Bryn whispered to Tommy. Oh, hell, that's so hot, Brenda exclaimed. She glanced to her left, and I caught a glimpse of Bruce's bare back through his upstairs window. He was unmistakably engaged with someone. Curious, I lingered, half expecting to catch a glimpse of Cheryl. But when Bruce turned around, my world came crashing down. Holy crap. I couldn't help but yell so loudly that the lovemaking halted below. Bruce was with my Robin. I froze, conflicted about what to do next. I aimed at Bruce but got distracted as Tommy and Brenda dashed naked towards their house. I looked up again, intent on confronting Bruce, but they had vanished. God damn filthy woman. I roared, grabbing my Mossberg and loading it with buckshot. Bruce and the promiscuous are going to pay. Cheryl's cat and parakeet are fair game too. I stormed out, pistol tucked into my jeans. Halfway down the driveway, I paused. Everything made sense now. My house was a mess. Meals were half-hearted attempts, and my little Johnny was neglected because Bruce had been wearing her out. She showered so frequently the reservoir might as well bear my name. Fuming, I jumped into my truck, leaving tire marks as I sped toward Lowe's. Along the way, I pieced it all together. She never cooked because Bruce left her exhausted. She couldn't clean while they were getting their freak on. The betrayal by the two people I trusted most cut deep. At Lowe's, I headed straight for the door section and grabbed three new lock sets. Jeannie at the paint counter greeted me, but I barely managed a half-hearted wave back. When I returned, Brenda and Tommy were waiting in my driveway. What do these perverts want now? I wondered, noticing their guilty expressions. Brenda offered a sheepish smile. We're sorry to have disturbed you, Mr. Erickson. We didn't mean to offend you. It's just, I cut her off sharply. I don't care if you screw each other until your holes turn to tunnels. It's none of my business. You guys aren't even on my radar of problems right now. They walked away, looking deflated. I felt Brenda's gaze on me as I went inside to find my tools. That's when I saw Bruce sitting at my kitchen table. What are you doing in my house, you cursed sucker? I demanded. I came to talk to you as a friend, Bruce replied. Friend? I laughed bitterly. With friends like you, who needs enemies? Did you enjoy my wife this morning, Bruce? It doesn't have to be this way, he said calmly. You're right, I retorted, sliding a butcher knife across the table. Pick it up, a hole. You love Jesus so much. I want you to meet him now. 
Pick up the knife and let me put the make my day law to use. You trespassing piece of pious crap. Bruce hesitated, then jumped up and ran for the door. He stopped on the porch, turning back. Jack, we've been friends forever. Are you really willing to throw that away? I lost two people today, Bruce. But I think when I get past all of it, I'll realize it's no real loss. Where's Robin? I asked. She's at my house. She's afraid to come over here, he admitted, his voice tinged with regret. Tell her she has five minutes to get here if she wants any chance of saving this marriage. Now, get off my property before I risk prison just to feel better, I warned Bruce sternly. He hurried off, and I was left pondering how long it would take for Robin to make her way back home. Exactly four minutes later, I could hear her crying long before she came into view. As she approached, her tears were unmistakable, and I imagined the neighbors must have been curious about the spectacle. As she reached out for a hug, I recoiled. Keep your filthy hands to yourself, I commanded sharply. But I love you, baby. I only want to be with you, she pleaded, her voice breaking. Let's go inside. These neighbors don't need to hear our dirty laundry, I said, moving towards the living room. I sank into my favorite chair while she settled onto the love seat. Would you sit next to me? She asked timidly. Hell no, I don't want to be anywhere near you, I refused flatly. The awkward silence hung heavy, so I broke it. How long have you been cheating with him? He loves you like a brother, he's your best friend, she tried to justify. Jack and was my friend, I corrected her sharply. Friends don't sleep with their friends' wives. It's just lovemaking. I still love you, she insisted desperately. What a load of crap. It's just lovemaking. Whoever thought of that excuse deserves a cinder block to the head. I shouted. No need to be angry. You still have me. I'm not going anywhere, she said softly. Yes, you are. You're choosing Bruce over me and our marriage. You can't spare five minutes for your husband, but you can bend over for him any time. How wonderful, I retorted sarcastically. A headache began to throb at my temples, and I cradled my head in my hands. She started to get up, perhaps to approach me, but I stopped her. Sit back down. I hope it's worth throwing away a decade of marriage, I said coldly. I'm not ending our marriage. We can stay married. I'll just have lovemaking with Bruce. I don't love him. It's just physical, she explained as if it made any sense. How thoughtful of him. I think I'll find someone else to meet my needs, I remarked dryly. No, you're my husband. No one else should be with you. We're still man and wife, she argued, her voice tinged with desperation. Not for much longer. Ex-wife is more fitting for someone like you and that hypocritical jerk, Bruce Harris, I declared. Please, don't talk like that. I love you with all my heart, but I also love Bruce. You just need to understand Bruce's plan. We can all be happy she tried to reason. I understand perfectly. You want to have your cake and eat it too, I concluded bitterly. It's not like that at all, she protested. Then explain it to me, I challenged. I can't, you'd never, wait, um, I think Bruce wants me back in three minutes, she stammered, caught off guard by her own words. What the hell are you babbling about? I demanded, watching the shock register on her face. You've never called me names or talked this way to me. What's gotten into you? She inquired, her voice shaky. Let's see. I haven't slept since 6 o'clock a.m. Yesterday, and I worked all night. Or maybe it's because I got home to find my wife cheating on me, you idiot, I snapped harshly. At that, she burst into tears and headed for the door, her sobbing echoing through the quiet house as she left. That's it. Go to Bruce. Go get the meat you crave. I shouted, my voice filled with anger and despair. She paused at the door, turning back with a plea in her eyes. I don't see why we can't keep things as they are. You're not home all the time. I can be his while you're at work, she said, desperation clear in her voice. I slammed the door so hard, the sound echoed through the house. Screw you. Go eat your cake. I yelled, my throat burning from the force of my shout. I leaned against the door, feeling a mix of anger and humiliation. My father would have been appalled to see me this way. His lessons about being tough echoed in my mind, so I pushed back the tears and focused on what needed to be done. I started by changing the locks on all the doors and recoding the garage opener. By 4 o'clock p.m., I was mentally and physically exhausted and needed a break. I flopped down on the couch and turned on the TV. Jerry Springer was on. 
ironically showcasing episodes about cheating wives and dysfunctional families. The irony wasn't lost on me, but exhaustion took over and I drifted off to sleep. When I woke up, it was past 9 o'clock p.m., and someone was knocking at my door. Groggily, I answered it to find Bruce standing there. What do you want? I ought to strike the crap out of you, I said, my anger reigniting. I need a favor, Bruce replied sheepishly. If you don't take the cake, I don't have a girlfriend for you to screw. Try elsewhere, I retorted with sarcasm. Robin needs you. She's crying her eyes out. Can't you call her and tell her you're not angry and everything will be okay? He pleaded. Tell her everything will be okay? I'm done with both of you. What's Cheryl going to say when she finds out you're screwing Robin? I challenged him. She knows. She's happy the sneaking around can stop. She wants you two to stay together, he admitted. Get off my porch. Tell her her stuff will be on the porch in the morning. Any door knocking will be met kindly, I warned, my voice cold and firm. I slammed the door in his face and grabbed a cold beer from the fridge. For some reason, I took my six-pack upstairs and sat in Robin's craft room, staring out the window. It dawned on me that I should record evidence for the divorce, so I grabbed the camcorder. As I focused on Bruce's house, I noticed movement next door. Jerry McBain was at the pool in a robe, and despite hoping she was modestly dressed underneath, Jerry revealed her less flattering swimwear as she dove into the pool. Turning my attention back to Bruce's house, I continued recording. The camera's night vision picked up Cheryl and Robin on the porch swing, talking quietly. Soon, headlights illuminated Bruce's house. Tom must have returned from managing his restaurant. He went straight to the pool and started stripping down. I muttered to myself, What did I do to deserve this? As I watched the scene unfold, Bruce's house was quiet until I heard Tom enter the pool. They embraced in the water. How was work, babe? Jerry asked. Busy. I had to fire Juan for smoking dope on his break, Tom replied. Did you warn him? She inquired. I heard something interesting today, he said, changing the subject. Do tell, she prompted. Jack kicked Robin out today, he informed. What? She exclaimed in surprise. Yeah, he actually kicked her out, Tom confirmed. Has he lost it? Those two would die without each other. I always thought she'd throw him out for his foul mouth, Jerry remarked, puzzled. You have to be wrong, Tom doubted, his voice reflecting his confusion. Tommy and Brenda told me, when they were cleaning the pool, they saw Bruce and Robin having lovemaking in Bruce's window, he explained. Jack must have been home unexpectedly. They heard Jack yell out profanities, watching as Bruce and Robin abruptly stopped their encounter. Jack stormed off, returning shortly with a bag from Lowe's, intent on changing the locks. Later, they overheard him calling Robin promiscuous, Jerry explained to Tom relaying the events with a mix of disbelief and concern. I can't believe it, Tom responded, shaking his head. I'll check on Jack tomorrow. I want you to stay away from Bruce. I've always had a feeling he eyed both you and Robin a bit too closely. The thought of Bruce undressing Jerry mentally was enough to make me shudder. Brenda mentioned she'd take Jack a cake tomorrow to cheer him up. Despite his rough edges, she admired him greatly. He's crude but I can't think of anyone else I'd rather have by my side, Jerry admitted, seeing him earlier that day near the mall. Was he wearing his hard hat? Tom asked with a chuckle. Yes, she confirmed, prompting a playful nudge from Tom. You and your construction worker fascination. Maybe I can get Jack to model it for you, he teased. I shuddered again, feeling a mix of amusement and discomfort. Normally, a guy loves to hear a woman finds him attractive, but during the first few weeks I met them, I thought Tom and Jerry were a couple. Jerry can indeed look quite manly. You're so bad, she told him with a laugh. I can't understand why Robin would choose Bruce over Jack, she mused aloud. You're starting to give me a complex, Tom joked back. You're the only hunk for me, my hot man, Jerry reassured him, making it clear they were about to become intimate. Deciding that was my cue to exit, I headed to bed, not wanting to overhear more of their private moments. I turned on the radio for some background noise, tuning into the heavy metal grindcore show on the college station. I listened to tracks by Carcass, Deicide, and Obituary. As the show concluded, they played Cannibal Corpses Make Them Suffer. As I listened, the lyrics resonated deeply with me. Make them suffer, make them suffer, make them suffer. I vowed silently, Corpse-a-Grinder, I will. 
The next morning, I was jolted awake by persistent knocking. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I went to see who had such an early morning desire to disturb me. Ready to lash out at Robin, I was surprised to find Cheryl Harris at my door. Oh, it's you. What do you want? Robin's stuff isn't packed yet, I said. My voice tinged with annoyance. I don't want you to pack her stuff, Jack. I want you to let her come back home, Cheryl responded earnestly. And I thought you were going to ask for something unreasonable. I'm going back to bed, I replied, starting to close the door, but she blocked it. Wait, Jack. Why are you doing this? Robin is hurting, and you won't even consider her feelings, she pleaded. What's there to consider? She wants to be with you and Bruce more than me. I'm just staying out of the way, I explained, my voice firm. Bruce and I can't have her live with us. We have an image to protect, she pleaded, her voice desperate. You should have thought of that before dragging my wife into your twisted games. Why can't she live with you? Really, you don't see a problem here? I challenged her. I gave her a chance to stay. She chose your husband's company over me. The worst part is, you don't seem to care. But I do care, she insisted. Now leave me alone, I demanded, my patience wearing thin. She still loves you, Jack. We didn't want to take her away from you. We love her. And you too. I hate to see you throw away your friendship with Bruce, Cheryl continued. He's dead to me. So is she, I stated coldly, closing the door on any reconciliation. You can't mean that, Jack. She can still meet your needs. She tried one last time to persuade me. Really? Is that so? I shot back with a heavy dose of sarcasm. I've given her everything. Shelter, clothes, a car. You enjoy her company too. And what do I get? A polite handshake every week, while Bruce enjoys his pleasures without spending a dime. Screw that. Do I get any real affection from you? I pressed her for an answer. Sorry, Jack, but I'm committed to one man only, she replied firmly. One man woman, huh? I muttered, a smirk playing on my lips. Guess that's exactly what I need to look for myself. That's right, and that's what you should find, she agreed. Listen, we can't let Robin stay with us anymore. We have a reputation at church to uphold. That sounds like your issue, not mine, I retorted, as I began to close the door. Get off my porch, Cheryl. As she pleaded, I cut her off. That's your mess. Handle it. It sucks to be you. And with that, I slammed the door shut. Alone in the kitchen, I decided to cook some bacon, mulling over their hypocrisy. They want to play perfect while messing around? Not my circus, not my monkeys, I thought angrily. Recalling some grim advice from Corpse Grinder's song, Make Them Suffer, I phoned a colleague who had been through a rough divorce himself. He recommended a law firm known for their tough stance in divorce cases, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Later, I gathered all of Robin's belongings, packed them neatly, and left them on the porch. Her car keys, I hid under the mat. At the bank, I severed our financial ties, canceling credit cards, and closing our joint account. I redirected her secret credit card bill to Bruce's address. At the law firm, I met with Bert Young, a rather rugged but highly competent lawyer. He listened intently, took down details, and set his assistant to work on the paperwork. Mr. Erickson, I believe we can resolve this in your favor and even take the preacher down a peg or two, he assured me. Even though I lacked solid proof like photos or videos, some neighborhood kids had witnessed enough. I just wanted this chapter of my life closed. After signing the necessary documents, I paid Bert's retainer and went home to rest. By the time I returned, Robin's belongings were gone, and a desperate note from her was stuck to my door. It didn't sway me. Bert and I planned to serve her and Bruce with the legal papers at their church on Sunday, a move I found particularly satisfying. Feeling drained yet determined, I deleted over 50 voicemails with the help of a few beers and slept soundly. The next day, ready to deal the next blow, I called the city accounting department. I had facilitated some free services for Bruce's church before, holding on to the receipts just in case. Now, it was time for Bruce to face the music as I made sure the unpaid bills would find their way to him. Bruce was now in a $7,500 hole with the city for gravel, and to add insult to injury, building inspectors were on their way to check for unapproved structures. I made a discreet call to the water company's supervisor about their non-compliant water meter. Looks like it'll be about $1,200 to get that fixed, I mentioned offhand.
knowing that Bruce had skirted financial responsibilities with my help before. But now, it was time to turn up the heat. Numerous home improvements at Bruce's place hadn't seen a building inspector's approval. That was about to change. I tipped off the inspectors, and they were eager to make an example out of him. True to form, Bruce called me around noon, sounding frantic. Jack, what's going on here? They're saying I need to redo the entire parking lot. You assured me everything was squared away. He protested. Oh, that? Must have slipped my mind to file some paperwork. I'll probably get a slap on the wrist at work, I replied coolly. I hope they fire you for this. Bruce snapped. Just then, my supervisor walked in, overhearing the tail end of our conversation. Jack, about that late paperwork, remind me to put a stern post-it note in your file. He joked with a smirk. I laughed. Sure. I might need a post-it to remind me about that reminder. Don't let it happen again, all right? My supervisor quipped, exiting with a chuckle. Bruce's voice dripped with sarcasm. Severe reprimand, Jack. I'm shocked he didn't dock you a nickel. Don't worry, Bruce. All my tear slips are in order. Expect a hefty bill soon, I retorted before he hung up, seething. That evening, I headed to MB's bar a popular hangout for city workers and police officers. By 11 p.m., most knew of my plight. Sympathetic to my cause, a full-blown maltreatment campaign began to unfold. A cop buddy hinted that Bruce might find himself pulled over a bit more frequently. A fire department acquaintance suggested adding the church to the inspection roster come Monday. Churches often lag on safety updates. This time we'll make sure everything's up to code, he mentioned, implying a rigorous inspection was due. Sheila Torres from the county clerk's office threw in her two cents. I heard the tax assessor found some discrepancies in Bruce's property taxes. Looks like he's got a sizable back payment coming, she said, raising her glass. Make them suffer indeed, she toasted. The next morning, as I tinkered in my garage, the neighborhood was buzzing. Not the most serene backdrop with the scantily clad neighbors and their rowdy antics. I was restoring a cabinet when a figure approached. Expecting Robin, I turned to find Brenda instead. Hi, Jack, I mean Mr. Erickson, she greeted, a subtle shift in how she addressed me. Hi, Brenda, what can I do for you? I asked, noticing but disregarding her suggestive demeanor. I have something that might interest you, she said, handing me a USB stick. Her touch lingered slightly longer than necessary. It's a video from last week. Might be useful for your case, she suggested, her eyes momentarily betraying her intentions before she regained her composure. Thanks for this, Brenda. I'll take a look, I replied as she walked away, casting a glance back. Glad to help, Jack. Have a good one, she called back, using my first name for the first time. I pocketed the USB stick and returned to my tasks, curious about what secrets it held. Amidst the monotony of mowing the lawn, with Robin's incessant screaming from Bruce's balcony piercing the air, I added by a loud MP3 player to my mental checklist. Fortunately, our neighbors Tom and Jerry steered clear of calling the cops, and the whole family opted to stay inside, blasting the AC to drown out the noise. By five, craving a change of scenery, I made my way to Joe's Pit BQ for their famous rib platter. While savoring my meal, I spotted John Brandon, Cheryl's brother, across the room. John worked as an engineer for the city-county road department, and we'd always gotten along well. Although unsure of his current sentiments given the family ties, I pretended not to notice him initially. However, he soon approached after conversing briefly with Ramona, Joe's wife, and placing a to-go order. Hi, Jack, he greeted, sliding into the booth opposite me. Haven't seen you around in ages. Been tied up, I responded. Seems like we clear one storm only for another to hit. John nodded. Yeah, I hear that. We're opening bids next week for the Johnson Street Bridge. Sounds like you guys might be involved though the commissioners are leaning heavily on contractors for the bulk of the work. That'd be a relief, I replied. We still have a hundred potholes to fill and three park irrigation systems to fix up. As we chatted, I sensed he might be digging for information but couldn't be sure. We exchanged a few more pleasantries before John steered the conversation to a more pointed topic. I heard through the grapevine about my brother-in-law's church. Sounds like they're facing some hefty fines for upgrades. It's about time someone stepped on that dirtbag's toes. Remind me never to get on your bad side, Jack, he chuckled, giving my shoulder a friendly pat. Will do, I said with a half smile as he gathered his food and left.
After finishing my meal and making a stop at Chang's Liquor for a bottle of vodka, I headed home, intent on a quiet evening. However, the USB stick Brenda had handed me earlier piqued my curiosity. Plugging it into my laptop, I was greeted by a file featuring Brenda in a rather compromising position, addressing me with provocative words over the sound of my lawnmower in the background. I grimaced, remembering her glances while I mowed. Fast forwarding through personal moments, the video shifted to a scene showing Robin, Bruce, and Cheryl in an explicit tryst on their terrace, mere yards from where I'd been oblivious. Now armed with undeniable evidence, I felt both vindicated and foolish for not noticing sooner. The video wouldn't just serve as evidence in my divorce, it had another purpose. Invigorated by the prospect of retribution, I rose early on Sunday, ready for church. After a quick coffee and bagel, I drove to Vinewood Presbyterian Church. In the parking lot, I noticed others who likely weren't regular attendees of Bruce's services. We entered together and I positioned myself strategically. Catching the eye of Robert Donovan, who managed the church's audio-video system and owed me a few favors, I knew my moment was near. As the choir, featuring Cheryl and Robin, started their procession, Bruce began his sermon on forgiveness, conveniently omitting any reference to the Seventh Commandment. The congregation sang hymns, and as the offering plates began their rounds, I prepared for the culmination of my plan. During the sermon, once the offering was collected, it was taken to Robert who discreetly counted the money. About ten minutes later, Bruce transitioned to welcoming newcomers, inviting any guests to introduce themselves. My three strategically invited guests stood up and confidently walked to the pulpit. Bruce, unaware of what was to unfold, shook hands with each before handing them the microphone. The first to speak was a young brunette woman. I'm here to meet Cher Harris, she declared. Cheryl, taken aback by her own name being called in such a context, stepped forward with a confused look on her face. The brunette passed the microphone to a red-haired teenager with a noticeable case of acne. I'm here for Robin Erickson, he stated firmly. As Robin approached, looking equally puzzled, he handed the microphone to the final guest, Neil Young, the son of their boss. Bruce Harris, Cheryl Harris, and Robin Erickson, you have been served, Neil announced, handing over legal documents to the astonished trio. In an immediate reaction, Bruce grabbed his own mic, his voice trembling as he asked, why have you defiled my sanctuary? That's when Robert played his part. He streamed the compromising video of Bruce, Cheryl, and Robin on the big screen behind the pulpit. The explicit images shocked the congregation. Several elderly ladies reached for their phones, presumably to call the authorities, while one spirited old woman struck Bruce with her cane. Robin, in a panic, read her papers and screamed out loud. As chaos erupted, I made my way to the exit, but paused to see Robin charging towards me while Bruce remained rooted to his spot, likely in shock or pain. Days later, after the initial furor had settled and the district attorney opted not to pursue charges against me, Bruce was forced to erect a privacy fence as stipulated by his new restraining order. My interactions with his church were now strictly limited to city business, and he was prohibited from any form of retaliation against me. Robin was allowed communication through our mutual attorney, Bert Young. Sonny Bono, our assistant DA, had a good laugh when I told him how I'd slipped the USB into the collection plate for Robert to find. Bruce's attempts to have me charged with trespassing fell flat, as it was a public service. Unfortunately, Robert lost his job but found a new position at a different church soon after. Bert Young briefed me on the upcoming court proceedings with Judge Sonia Kagan. Known for her tough stance, particularly in favor of wives in divorce cases, Bert cautioned that while I was likely safe in retaining my house, alimony could still be a concern. At work, I mostly ran my team autonomously, thanks to a fresh-faced college grad supervisor who rarely interfered, trusting my judgment. Unlike Marvin Taylor, another supervisor known for his poor management and offensive remarks, Marvin's position seemed secure, likely due to some leverage over city officials or past indiscretions with influential figures. Marvin sauntered into my office one day, his presence always a test of patience. So Jackie boy, I hear you're getting a divorce. Did she catch you in some unsavory act? He jested crudely, not one to mince words. I brushed off his probing with a simple, no, just got tired of her antics. Knowing his son had been through a rough divorce under Judge Kagan, I anticipated his cynical view on my chances. Marvin, ever the provocateur, managed to offend just about everyone with his coarse language. 
I often wondered how he behaved in front of Jimmy Reigns, our African-American foreman and former NFL player. Jimmy was a formidable figure, but known among the guys for his sense of humor and fair play. At a bar once, he'd playfully intimidated some unruly college kids, earning a chuckle from those who knew his gentle nature. Despite Marvin's demeanor, Jimmy wouldn't find anything amusing about his boss's offensive slurs. With just two weeks until facing Judge Kagan, my nerves were rattled, and not even Jimmy could shield me from what awaited in court. Judge Kagan, known for her steely demeanor, didn't flinch as I burst out in frustration. This witch ordered couples counseling. I protested. When I adamantly refused, she even hinted at jail time. I turned desperately to Bert. Come on, tell her this therapy nonsense isn't happening. I addressed the judge directly, my frustration palpable. I just want to be free from this nightmare and her preacher cronies. Bruce looked utterly defeated, hanging his head low. Cheryl, on the other hand, appeared incensed, her fury barely contained. Meanwhile, Bert, ever the strategist, had subpoenaed the Harrises as witnesses. The church Bruce once proudly led was now a shell of its former self, with his twice-weekly services for 150 members dwindled to a meager gathering of 10, plus three representatives from the main church planning his replacement. The once vibrant choir of 20 had shrunk to Cheryl, Robin, and Charles Brown. Amid the court proceedings, Robin tried to justify her actions. It was just lovemaking, she started, hoping perhaps the judge would buy her flimsy excuse. If I had been caught with Rebecca Sanders, known in town for her escapades, would she have been as forgiving? Jack works so much, and I felt neglected, Robin claimed. She outlined my work hours, painting herself as the lonely wife despite my regular hours and minimal night calls over the last 18 months. Her next justification was more salacious. My first time with Bruce was out of curiosity. I'd heard about his, well, attributes. The age-old excuse of curiosity felt almost cliche as she spoke. My mind wandered back to how it all began with Robin. The setting was a homecoming event at Summit, Southern Colorado State, known more for its parties than its football prowess. Willie Barnes, a notorious figure around campus, hosted these gatherings despite his questionable motives. He was later arrested for his misconduct towards younger attendees. That year, the homecoming was unusually festive since our team, the Fighting Farmers, had won, albeit against a weakened opponent suffering from stomach flu. I wasn't a student but worked part-time for the city and campus maintenance, hopeful to save enough for classes. We were instructed to party first and clean up the aftermath the next morning, so the celebration was lively and extended. Jerry Barnes, a friend and Willie's cousin, invited me to the bash at Willie's ranch. By 11 p.m., I was feeling the effects of the night's indulgences. Stepping out to the parking lot to relieve myself, I inadvertently aimed at an unoccupied-looking car. As I zipped up, the car's headlights flickered on, revealing an indistinct figure and a brunette who locked eyes with me in a compromising position. Mortified, I apologized and hurried back to the bonfire. Trying to avoid further awkward encounters, I passed a group of frat boys who greeted me warmly. While mingling, I felt a fleeting touch on my hip and turned just in time to see the brunette walking away. The next morning, nestled in my jeans pocket, I found a note from her. If you liked what you saw as much as I liked what I saw, call me. Robin along with her number, it left me pondering if the encounter was just a fleeting moment or the start of something more as I spent the day clearing debris and wondering if the note was real. During my last break of the day, I finally decided to make the call. Hello? A voice answered. Hi, may I speak with Robin? I inquired. She's not here right now. Can I take a message? The voice responded. Yeah, tell her the guy from the party called. He liked what he saw, I said, leaving my number and wondering if I had mistakenly given it to someone else that evening. As I settled down to watch a recorded Broncos game, my phone unexpectedly rang. Yeah, I don't know your name, but I've seen your package, said a gruff but distinctly feminine voice. I was skeptical, thinking it might be a prank. Should I just call you Moby Dick? I asked half-joking. Nope, Jack will work just fine, she replied Robin. Is that you? I sought confirmation. Yes, it's Robin. Sorry, my voice is hoarse from yelling at the game yesterday, she explained. Yelling at the game, huh? Would you like to meet up at Frankie's Inn in an hour? I'd like to get a better look at your face and prove this isn't a prank, I suggested. Sure, I'll be there in an hour, wearing a Shannon Sharp jersey and jeans, she agreed. 
Okay, that's number 13 for the Chargers, right? I teased her. No, number 84 for the Broncos. What will you be wearing? She clarified, describing her outfit. Forty-five minutes later, I was at Frankie's Cafe, scanning the entrance. I had opted not to wear my jersey, thinking it might be wise to have an easy out. Twenty minutes later, she walked in, exactly as she had described, looking striking. I felt a bit foolish for not donning my jersey. I stood and waved, and she made her way over, dismissing a few guys who tried to stop her. Funny-looking Bronco jersey, Jack. Afraid of getting tricked? She teased. Honestly, I wanted an escape route in case you weren't as advertised, I admitted. I can't blame you, she said with a smile. We spent the evening drinking coffee and sharing pie until the cafe closed, then said our goodbyes. We dated for a month before becoming physically involved. On the night I planned to make my move, I called Bruce to tell him I was getting serious with a girl. He advised making sure our feelings were genuine to avoid heartache. Ironically, ten years later, she broke my heart because of him. I realized I had chuckled out loud when Robin and Dr. Landers looked at me as if I'd just ruined their fruit salad. Do you find amusement in Robin's pain, Mr. Erickson? Drive? Landers asked sternly. More in my own, I believe. I owe Gary Wayne an overdue apology. I replied Robin seemed puzzled. She had briefly dated Gary, then quickly moved on to Justin Lore, the guy she was with at the party. Two days later, rumors circulated that Gary wasn't well endowed enough for her. Why would you owe him an apology, Robin asked. Her curiosity peaked. I might have punched him for telling the truth, I admitted. What truth? She inquired further. He said Robin should be nicknamed Big Bird because she was always seeking a bigger branch to sit on, I explained. I don't understand, she said, still puzzled. She's a size queen, I clarified Drobin blushed angrily. She had dumped Gary because he was inadequately endowed, then dumped Justin for me. Now, she had discovered my ex-best friend was better endowed and had jumped ship to him. It's just filthy, I elaborated. If you say it's just lovemaking, I'll leave and do my time in jail for contempt. I threatened Drobin and Doctor. Landers were visibly shocked by my bluntness. Drive? Landers gathered her thoughts, and with a serious tone, she began, Robin, your understanding of Neanderthals seems a bit off. You see, there are many happily married couples who enjoy having multiple partners. It's not unusual for some husbands to even find joy in seeing their wives with a more well-endowed man, she explained carefully. I was shocked. What are you even talking about? I interrupted, my voice laced with disbelief. There's no way any drug could make me okay with that kind of arrangement. It doesn't matter what others enjoy. I would never be able to watch my spouse with someone else. I'd end things before ever considering such a setup. I declared emphatically. Jack, isn't it worth considering all perspectives in your marriage? Drive? Landers calmly suggested. No one is saying you have to participate or clean up after such events. Robin chimed in with enthusiasm. Yeah, Jack, imagine how exciting it could be. I could even be there for you afterwards. Anger bubbled up inside me. Are you kidding me? You think I'd accept your offer after being with Bruce? And next, you'll probably want me in pink lingerie, watching you two from a cage at the foot of your bed. I spat out the words. Robin replied nonchalantly, Oh no, Jack. We'd never make you sleep in a cage. Your own bed would be just fine. That's it. I'm done here. I shouted, storming towards the door. I was sure the receptionist was on the brink of calling for help. Mr. Erickson, you were ordered to attend these sessions. Leaving now could lead to jail time for contempt of court, doctor. Landers reminded me sternly. I've been here for an hour. That's enough. I don't need this, I countered, locking eyes with doctor. Landers, tell the judge whatever you want. It'll be a cold day in hell before I associate with that person again, I added, pointing angrily at Robin. Determined to take further action, I declared, I'll also be talking to my lawyers about revoking your license. As I left the building, a wave of relief washed over me. I felt more liberated than I had in a long time. I drove directly to Bert's office. Bert looked up with concern. Please tell me you didn't do anything drastic, he said anxiously. I held back, but I definitely gave them a piece of my mind. I recounted the details of the session and the patronizing tone I had endured. Jack, you're not the only one to voice concerns. Unfortunately, these complaints often get ignored. 
I'd have warned you, but I risked facing charges myself, Bert explained. I'm not going back. They can throw me in jail if they want, but I won't sit through another minute of that nonsense, I declared firmly. Bert nodded, understanding the gravity of the situation. I'll have David Crosby make some calls. Just try to keep out of trouble, Jack. We'll get this sorted out soon, he reassured me. That evening, needing to unwind, I went home. I marked three years sober on my calendar. Since it was still early, I relaxed with dinner and a beer, watching a ball game. As the innings passed, a thunderstorm brewed, signaling a busy period ahead for roofing crews due to hail damage. I prepared for a long night, knowing my neighborhood was facing pea-sized hail, while reports confirmed larger hailstones in Midtown. When the call finally came, instead of dealing with the hail, half the crew and I rushed to reinforce the river dike, threatened by the heavy rain. By 4 o'clock a. m., the Army Corps of Engineers had confirmed the dike's safety, and the county reported that the bridge situation was under control. We continued to work hard, spending another three hours clearing the aftermath of the storm. By the time 9 o'clock a. m., on Friday rolled around, I was pulling into my driveway. The thought that I wouldn't catch my wife with Bruce crossed my mind, but only because she was no longer my wife. I was still buzzing from the mix of coffee and energy drinks I'd consumed, but I thought a shot of Jägermeister might smooth the transition to sleep. After emptying the bottle, I sprawled out on the couch to watch TV and soon fell into a deep sleep. I was jolted awake by a knocking at my door. It was nearly 11 o'clock. Brenda McBain stood on my porch. What does she want? I muttered to myself. I flicked on the porch light and opened the door. Sorry to disturb you, Jack, but there's something you need to see. It might be crucial for your divorce, she said, her tone serious yet enticing. Brenda looked striking in her tight shorts and a yellow halter top. She said something more, then turned and walked back to her car. I followed her, intrigued by her confident stride. As we drove in silence, my eyes were drawn to her legs, a noticeable upgrade from Robin's or Cheryl's. Brenda caught me staring a couple of times and just smiled. She drove us to a cluster of abandoned buildings in downtown. The city had owned them for years, hoping for developers to take interest, but decisions always got blocked by secretive votes from the Board of Trustees. The cost to maintain and secure these properties was a burden to the city. Two years earlier, a chain-link fence had been erected to deter trespassers. We parked near the old power plant, which surprisingly had more cars than I expected. Brenda, what are we doing here? We could get into serious trouble if we're caught, I said, my unease growing. Just come on, Jack. You'll see, this is going to help you a lot, Brenda reassured me with a wink. I couldn't see how trespassing would aid my divorce, but curiosity pushed me to follow her. She led the way through a cut in the fence and up to a basement window of the old King James Hotel. I caught up as she pointed to a faint glow coming from inside, odd since the building had no power. Peering through the window revealed why Brenda had brought me here. I gasped in shock. Brenda handed me her camcorder as we headed home. Tommy and I were spying on Bruce and Robin when he mentioned this place. So the next Friday we followed them here, she explained. I was shocked Cheryl didn't show up. That was her Friday night choir practice? I asked, incredulous. Brenda looked embarrassed that I had uncovered yet another of my wife's secrets. Don't worry, Brenda. I'll keep you and Tommy out of this. My issue is with the others, I reassured her. You know, Tommy and I hook up because we think we're too ugly for anyone else to want us. Brenda suddenly blurted out. Where did that come from? I wondered aloud. I had never questioned their activities. That can't be true. I bet many guys would love to be with you, I said, trying to offer some comfort. Maybe some guy would use me, but none want to be seen in public with me, she lamented. I've had three boyfriends who dated prudes and met me in secret. They call me bummer faces and a three-bagger, one bag on my head, one on his in case mine falls off, and one by the door. I'm good enough for secret lovemaking, but not to date or show off. Come on, Brenda, it can't be as bad as you think. If I were your age, I'd definitely be into you, I confessed, feeling a bit guilty for stretching the truth. But seeing her on the brink of tears, I knew it was the right thing to say. You've been a huge help to me, Brenda. How about dinner tomorrow? Dress up, and I'll pick you up at seven, okay? You don't have to pity me, Jack. Besides, I'm off to Denver tomorrow. Won't be back until Sunday evening, she replied softly. 
It's not pity. How about a rain check then? I suggested. She nodded, and I headed inside, knowing I had the leverage I needed. By morning, I was ready to make some moves. By Thursday, my plans were all set. I called Bert first. You know, what you're doing smells a bit like extortion, but I think it'll work, he warned. That explains why that judge always swings her decisions that way, I shot back. Next, I rang up Mike Starr, a high school buddy turned investigative reporter. I handed him the video and filled him in on the details. He'd already caught wind of some rumors and planned to expose the whole thing live on TV Monday morning. I then met with the city maintenance department head, proposing a plan that would tackle a storage issue and block hotel access simultaneously. We own the land, just need to get the zoning office on board. No need for board approval since we're reallocating, not selling, I explained. He was impressed. The fencing won't cost over 150 OO. No big budget requests. You've saved us at least half a million if this goes through. Great thinking, Jack, he complimented, hinting at a potential promotion. By Wednesday, we had the green light on all permits. I was appointed to oversee the implementation. A 10-man crew was ready in three weeks. We'd have snowplow storage and a new sand depot behind the hotel. Thursday morning saw us moving fencing materials to the old power plant lot. I clocked out at noon for my counseling session with Dr. Landers. Upon arriving, the receptionist shot me a glare and buzzed her boss. I was in Dr. Landers' office five minutes later. Drive? Landers, looking quite pleased with herself, started, Mr. Erickson, surprised to see you early. It's good to have a moment for a one-on-one -on -one before the session starts. One-on-one? -on -one? That's a new concept here, huh? I quipped, catching her off guard. She was puzzled. Excuse me, Mr. Erickson? I'm just here to say I'm done with this sham of a session and won't be paying another dime, I declared firmly. Her smugness returned momentarily. Judge Kagan ordered your attendance. You could go to jail for non-compliance. Save it, I'm not coming back, I interrupted, her warnings bouncing off me. Mr. Erickson, mind your language she cautioned, but I was unstoppable. The game is up. I know about your little club at the King James, and so will my friend Mike Starr very soon. All those cheaters getting breaks in Kagan's court. They'll be public news. There's no such club, she started to deny, but I cut her off. No lies. I've seen the evidence, like that elk head decked out with contraceptives. Doesn't look good, Doc, I said, watching her face lose color. I didn't mention that Mike already had the video evidence. The biggest losers would be Judge Kagan and her husband, high up in the DA's office. They couldn't afford this scandal, and neither could the DA, Jim Morrison, who had no tolerance for embarrassment. As I stood at the doorway, a last glance caught Dr. Lander's downcast face. Screw you, I echoed my earlier words, turning on my heel and exiting. About 20 minutes later, Robin was seated beside Dr. Lander's. My nerves tingled uncomfortably as the door buzzed exactly 10 minutes after I was due to meet Jack. Bruce, alongside my lawyer, the infamous Justin Bieber, reassured me that either Dr. Landers or Judge Kagan would sway Jack to see reason, or draw out the proceedings until he backed down. I dressed carefully for the occasion, choosing a shorter skirt and no tights, styling my hair in his preferred fashion, and misting myself with the perfume he had once gifted me. Upon entering, Dr., Lander's expression shifted to one of dismay. Jack was noticeably absent. I presumed he'd been sent away. Despite his evident disdain, I couldn't quell the lingering affection I held for him. It was becoming increasingly difficult to even stroll down our street or linger on our balcony while he was at home. Is Jack risking imprisonment just to avoid today's session? I inquired, already knowing Dr. Lander's distaste for Jack's brash masculinity and crude language. There's no session today, Robin, she replied, her voice tight. I'll call you when I have an update. She buzzed the door open, and I left, puzzled and a little shaken by her tone. Driving away, I headed to the church to catch up with Bruce, finding myself with some unexpected free time. Thoughts of the upcoming night at the Casanova Club began to heat my blood. Bruce and Terry Kagan would be there, and just the idea set my senses alight. If Bruce was alone when I arrived at the church, he was in for a surprise. The fantasy of having both Jack and Bruce together was nearly overwhelming, the very thought pushing me to the brink of excitement. At the church, Bruce was caught up in a phone conversation 
and shot me a look that clearly meant I'd have to wait. There will be no club meeting tonight, he eventually said, a grim tone to his voice. Jack found out and threatened to call Mike Starr. His next words cut deep. I'm regretting this, Robin. Your company isn't worth the hassle. Just months before, he couldn't get enough of me, claiming I surpassed Cheryl. Now, with just a bit of resistance from Jack, I was suddenly undesirable. Later that evening, after a silent dinner, Justin, my attorney, rang with news of a hearing set for the following morning. He speculated that it might indicate Jack had withdrawn his divorce petition. Could it be a contempt hearing for Jack? I asked. Justin thought not, explaining that if it were about Jack, we wouldn't have been summoned as well. He advised me to rest easy, optimistic about the next day. The next morning in Judge Kagan's courtroom, the atmosphere was tense. Jack's attorney and another man, unexpectedly Graham Nash, who hadn't set foot in a courtroom in over six years, were present. After a lengthy discussion at the bench, Justin returned looking troubled. Before I could inquire, Judge Kagan slammed her gavel down and declared my marriage to Jack would be dissolved in 90 days. I was to receive no alimony, just a portion of Jack's retirement and some of our liquid assets. Stunned, I barely registered when an EMT approached, concerned for my well-being. In the weeks that followed, the scandal involving the Casanova Club erupted, leading to Judge Kagan's removal and potential legal repercussions. Her husband was fired and faced charges in a prescription drug scheme, and Justin Bieber was removed from the bar for inappropriate conduct with male clients and involvement in the same drug ring. Drive? Landers was ordered to compensate 30 of her clients and was later found deceased alongside her husband in a tragic event ruled as murder-suicide. Bruce was compelled to resign from his pastoral duties, with his severance barely covering his moving costs. Cheryl, feeling betrayed, filed for divorce after discovering Bruce in a compromising situation while watching their neighbors swim. She blamed Bruce for their troubles, leading to their separation. Bruce, in a desperate attempt, tried to engage the famous group Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young as his legal representation, but they turned him down. He ended up with an inexperienced lawyer, and Cheryl ended up with the upper hand in their legal battles. The last I heard, Bruce had moved to Iowa and taken up preaching there. I secured employment at an accounting firm post-divorce, and Cheryl worked for a building contractor, eventually starting a relationship with one of his employees. I wasn't interested in dating. My thoughts often lingered on Jack. Sometimes I'd walk past our old street, where memories flooded back at the sight of the for sale sign. Recently, I saw that the house had been sold. Overwhelmed, I went to buy some comfort food, haagen dazs ice cream, and Chips Ahoy cookies. As I passed the frozen food aisle, I spotted Jack selecting a frozen pizza. Before I knew it, I was pouring my heart out in the middle of the store. I can't recall everything I said, but when I finally paused to catch my breath and wipe my tears, Jack looked mortified. With a crowd watching, he dismissively gestured towards himself and harshly told me to get lost. Then he walked away. Back in Las Vegas, I pulled into my driveway, noting the unkempt lawn that I planned to tackle on Saturday to avoid the midday heat. Inside, my wife greeted me with a passionate kiss. Hi, baby. Managed to keep those tourists and retirees from scamming the big companies? She teased. My role as a slot machine technician always sparked her playful side. And you, once you graduate next month, you'll join the corporate world too. I shot back playfully, hinting at future family plans. She kissed me again. Studying with the girls tonight? I inquired. Yes, but keep an eye on Samantha. She seems to have taken a liking to you. She quipped her calling past neighborhood dramas. I chuckled. Remember when Robin got involved with Mr. Harris? What a mess that was. Indeed, Brenda replied with a smirk. But hey, her loss is my gain. With another quick kiss, I headed out to grab some pizza, laughing about our banter and the little dramas that make life interesting. After three years of marriage with Brenda, I found myself heading to Vegas just three days after leaving Stonemore. Some might think I was a jerk for leaving Robin like that, but trust was shattered, and I couldn't piece it back together. I snuck out while she was sleeping, took care of the room bill, and hit the road. Thanks to my buddies, Noose and Noah, I reached Utah by dawn and rolled into Vegas two days later. In no time, I landed a job and found a place to live. The sale of my house and my retirement fund helped me buy a new home. Two weeks later, as planned, Brenda showed up. She had enrolled at UNLV, 
while waiting for my house to sell and my divorce to wrap up. Brenda and I grew close quickly. She'd bring over meals, and we'd spend our evenings watching movies or exploring the city on weekends. The more I got to know her, the more I liked her. I was proud to be seen with her. When I shared that Robin had begged me to come back, Brenda's eyes welled up with tears. Listen, I have no intention of going back to her, I reassured her, Brenda. I'm really falling for you, and I've got a plan if you're okay with sticking with an old guy like me. Before I could finish, she was all over me. That night, after three passionate rounds, one intense and two more laid back, I shared my plan. I was prepared for objections from Tom and Jerry, but there were none. Jack, you've always been a tough guy, but I can't think of anyone better for our daughter, Tom declared. I know you'll make her happy. She's loved you since you first moved here. A year after settling in Vegas, Brenda befriended a cosmetology student who taught her how to enhance her natural beauty. She changed up her hairstyle and really started turning heads. We got married after her first year of college. I even told her she could date guys her age, but she stopped talking to me for a week. When she finally spoke, she snapped, You silly, stupid jerk. I've only ever cared about one man. I watched the wrong woman toss you aside, and now I'm never letting you go. Back home, Tom and Jerry kept us in the loop. Cheryl married a Tyler, had a child, and moved to California. Robin, after being left in Wyoming, went back to Stonemore and married a rancher, who divorced her a year later for cheating. At the pizza place, the kid behind the counter handed me my order. Better get these home quick, I thought. Brenda might be up for some fun before her study group shows up. Then I'll head to my den to catch the Rockies game on my MLB season pass. From one dramatic woman to another, life's as satisfying as a perfect morning.